So a few days ago, Netflix released their adaptation for One Piece. And I'll be honest, I was not going to give it a chance. I wasn't going to bother even watching it. Mostly because, one, it's a Hollywood adaptation of a Japanese manga or anime series. And those are never really any good. I mean, you just got to look at Death Note, Dragon Ball Evolution, the most recent Cowboy Bebop. Hollywood pretty much sucks when it comes to adapting Japanese franchises. And, well, Hollywood just kind of sucks in general when it comes to modern day stuff. And so, yeah, I wasn't going to check it out. Especially when one of the main writers was uh, talking about how Luffy is like Kamala Harris. And I was like, oh, God, really? We're going down that route? We're going to turn a Japanese franchise that you had nothing to do with into your own political soapbox? That's going to go well. But then, surprisingly, it came out, and a lot of people were praising it. And when I say a lot of people, I'm not talking about the critics, because I never listen to them. But people who uh, you would think would hate this series were actually praising it. Fans were praising it. Fans of uh, the One Piece franchise. And then I looked more into it, and I found out that Oda, the creator of One Piece, was actually heavily involved in the making of this TV series. He was basically there to make sure that... The series stayed completely faithful to his vision of One Piece. And as soon as I heard that, I was like, all right, I'm going to give this thing a chance then. If Oda is involved and he's there to make sure that everything stays faithful, then I'm going to trust in Oda. Because that was a problem with Cowboy Bebop. They apparently brought Watanabe into the project as a consultant and they didn't do anything with any of his notes. And so he even said that he had no choice but to pray and hope that it turned out good. And as we all know, it didn't. It came out, everyone hated it, and it got canceled before it even got a second season. So I watched the first episode, and I will say that it is pretty damn good. I was heavily surprised. I was not expecting it to be that good. And I love the fact that the series pretty much adapts the kind of cartoony, whimsical look of the manga as much as you can in a live action. I mean, like in the manga, a lot of characters look kind of deformed. They don't have realistic body portions, right? And you can't do that here. But we have like the characters with different colored hairs, different whimsical outfits. We see like the CGI to kind of amplify the whimsicalness from the manga. Like this series does not shy away from the crazy over the topness of the manga. It embraces it. And that's a good thing. <laughs> that is a really good thing. <laughs> uh, I'll say that the casting has been pretty good so far. I was really surprised by, by Luffy. I was not expecting Luffy to be all that great. I have no idea. Like I've never seen any of these actors and other stuff before. But I will say that the actor for Luffy captures Luffy's like happy-go-lucky attitude. Zoro is real really great he kind of nails that role even nami is good and then just the casting for some of the other characters as well i think the casting for garp vice admiral garp is really good the casting for kobe even though we only saw him at the end buggy was good axan morgan and his son oh man like they nailed it they nailed the visuals they nailed the casting the storyline itself is pretty good it's pretty faithful i'm just i'm kind of blown away so yeah, uh, One Piece, Romance Dawn, we start off, it's just kind of uh, introducing this brand new world. Gold Roger, the King of Pirates, or the so-called King of Pirates, he's about to be executed. But before he's executed, he reveals that somewhere out there is his treasure, a large mass of treasure that he has collected during his pirate days before he was captured, and whoever gets that treasure will be the richest person in the world. And so he refuses to reveal where it's at. He just says it's out there somewhere. Go find it. And this starts the great pirate era. Everyone's trying to look for this one piece. And we have our main character, Monkey D. Luffy. He is a young pirate in the making. He doesn't have a crew. But he, his dream is to become the king of pirates. It's a dream he's had since he was a kid. And so he starts off with nothing but a, a raft that's sinking. 
and uh, eventually ends up on this ship captained by Alvida, a narcissistic pirate who believes that she is the greatest pirate to ever live. And Luffy quickly puts an end to that with uh, where we get some of the more over-the-topness. Luffy is not just a regular human. He is a human that has eaten the gum gum devil fruit. For anyone who's not familiar with what that is, there are devil fruits in this world that grant people who eat it powers. In Luffy's case, he is able to stretch out his body. His body basically becomes like rubber and he can stretch out all his limbs. He can contort his body. His body is basically like rubber that can stretch and... But speaking of Luffy and his gum gum devil fruit powers, I love the way that is portrayed here. Like that's one thing that I was kind of worried about. I was like, oh, how are they gonna do this? It's gonna like look like cheap CGI, isn't it? But the beauty of capturing the whimsical look is that your CGI doesn't have to be 100% perfect. Because everybody else looks over the top, your CGI can be a bit over the top. And so uh, the CGI actually works very well in this series. There are stuff like when you see a bunch of ships, you can tell that a lot of it is CGI. Obviously, when Luffy uses his rubber powers, you can tell it's CGI. But it works because everything else is so over the top and whimsical. Everyone has like weird colored hairs, weird fancy outfits. No one looks normal. Like no one in this series looks like someone that will you can just see walking in the middle of the street. It, it basically, everyone looks like they've come straight out of an anime convention or like a cosplay event or something. And so because of that, because of that, all the special effects just works beautifully. And so uh, that's another thing I got to praise this series for. Not just the special effects, but just the visuals in general. From the characters to the, the set pieces to the locations, everything here does not look like it was cheaply made. That's like a problem I've had with some other like fantasy stuff like let's take star wars for example the star wars series just looks really cheaply made which is kind of crazy since it's you know disney then again disney is losing a lot of money so maybe that explains why uh, they're not putting so much money into their production but disney it, it doesn't look like a uh, galaxy far far away disney just looks like a green screen with cheap cgi here though everything looks like a livable breathable world so I got to uh, I got to give props to the production crew for that. I also want to say that the introduction to all the main characters is pretty fantastic. Like we start off, like I said, with Luffy, and he's sharing his dream about how he wants to become the king of pirates, and he's going to gather a crew, and uh, he's going to get a big ship, and all this stuff. And it sounds like he's talking to us the audience, because he's looking right at us as he's sharing this story. But then it zooms down, and it turns out that he's talking to this bird, and the bird just kind of looks at him and then flies away. I just like the fact that here's this happy-go-lucky pirate dreamer, and he's on this tiny raft that's slowly sinking. And that's how we were introduced to Luffy. Meanwhile, we get the more serious, dramatic introduction with Zoro, where Zoro is at a shrine, and he lights up two candles, and he's paying respects. And then he gets approached by this man named Mr. Seven. And Mr. Seven reveals that he's been chasing after Zero, that he's an assassin that works for uh, Baroque Works. Baroque Works is like this assassination society. And he's sending out an invitation to Zero, who is a pirate hunter. He wants Zero to join the group. And he asks, like, you know, who are, did you light the shrine for? And he reveals that he lit it for someone long ago that he made a promise to. And the guy is like, well, you lit two. And the other one's supposed to be for this guy. Basically, like, I'm going to kill you. That's like the message Zoro's given. We get a fight scene. And Zoro easily dispatches of Mr. Seven. He just cuts him in half. And there's our introduction to Zoro. Meanwhile, we get our introduction to Nami, who is drifting out at sea in this raft. And all she has is this treasure chest with her. And she's basically, like, dehydrated. She's tired. Uh, this small pirate crew, I say small because it's only two dudes, arrive and basically they think that she's going to be like an easy target. They think like, oh, you know, like here's this beautiful lady. She's obviously in distress. She's weak and she has a treasure chest. We can take her and we can take her treasure chest. So they jump into a raft and they start smashing the lock on their treasure chest and they open it and it's empty. 
And then that's when Nami starts laughing and they turn and they see that Nami is sailing away in their boat. Uh, yeah, we see that Nami is basically a trickster. She is the one that uses her brains to outsmart other people. And uh, so that's our like, introduction to our three main characters. They each get their own little solo scenes. And then uh, we get one of the cooler moments in this is when we see all three characters, I don't want to say meeting together, but they all arrive at the same place at the same time. So they're on this island that's controlled by the Marines, whose job is to go out and hunt pirates. And Nami is there, and this Marine comes up to her and offers to buy her a drink. And she's like, nah, you're too tall. And then she sees this short guy about her size walk past her. And she falls after him, and she kind of starts hitting on him. And uh, meanwhile, Luffy is there with Kobe. And Kobe is a character who uh, Luffy met while on Alvida's ship. She was, he was basically Alvida's cabin boy. Uh, she kind of forced him to do cleanup duty and stuff. She, she, he was basically Alvida's slave. And after Luffy dispatched of her, uh, Kobe decides to go with Luffy. And Kobe's dream is to become a Marine. So Luffy's like, oh, all right, well, my dream is to find the Grand Line, which is where the One Piece should be. And your dream is to be a Marine. Why don't we go together to a Marine Island and I will find a map of the Grand Line and you can go join the Marines. And so they're together. They're inside this bar and Luffy's watching as Zoro shows up. Zoro shows up carrying a bag containing the upper half of the body of Mr. Seven. And he walks up to the counter and he's basically uh, ordering a drink and he's going to try to collect the bounty on Mr. Seven. And that's when this little girl shows up and she offers Zoro a rice ball covered in chocolate that she made for her. You know, she made herself. And Zoro kind of like brushes her away. And as she turns to walk away, she bumps into this guy named Helmelpo. And Helmelpo is the son of the Marine Captain Axhan Morgan, who runs the Marines on this island. She bumps into him, drops her rice balls, and Helmelpo basically yells at her, steps on the rice balls, tells her to apologize to him. And that's when Zoro kind of bends down. He grabs the mushed up rice ball and eats it, says it's very delicious. And then he offers the other rice ball to Helmelpo. Uh, he's kind of just almost antagonizing Himelpo. And so Himelpo, uh brings in the rest of the Marines and they start attacking Zoro. And as Zoro is fighting off all these guys, Nami uses this distraction to knock out the Marine that she was chatting up, drags him away out of sight, and then starts taking off his clothes because she's going to use it herself. That's why she was looking for someone her size. And Luffy's just watching all this like in amazement. Like, wow, this guy's a really good fighter. Maybe I can get him to join my crew. Zero basically leaves and he meets up with Axhan Morgan where he shows the, the body of Mr. Seven. He's here to collect the, the bounty. And Morgan says, um, you'll get your, your bounty money, but attacking a Marine is a crime with the punishment of seven days imprisonment. If you don't turn yourself in, then you'll no longer be able to collect bounties from the government because I'll tell the rest of the government about what you did. And so your career as a pirate hunter will be destroyed. He also offers a spot on the Marines for Zoro. But Zoro is like, no, I already have a job. It's a pirate hunter. I don't want to join the Marines. He says, seven days, right? Well, I guess I'll be able to catch up on my sleep. And so Zoro is tied up to a post. A Kamelpo comes and kind of taunts him. He's carrying one of Zoro's swords. It's uh, a third sword that Zoro has not used before. Every time we've seen Zoro fight, we've seen him use two other katanas. But there's a third katana that we've never seen him use before. And this katana seems to mean something to Zoro because when Helmelpo is waving it around and stuff, we can see that Zoro is paying really close attention to that sword. And uh, he taunts Zoro and says that, do you honestly think my father is going to let you go in seven days? Like you're going to be here until you die. And then he leaves. And that's when Luffy appears and Luffy is lost. He has been able to get into the, the base, but not exactly where he wants to be. And so he sees Zoro, he compliments Zoro on um, the fight scene that he had earlier at the bar. And he offers Zoro a spot on this crew. And Zoro turns him down. And basically says, I don't want to be a, a pirate. In fact, I actually hunt pirates. And Luffy asks, well, like, what is it that you want to be? Like, what's your dream? What drives you? 
and Zoro reveals that he made a promise to be the world's greatest swordsman. And Luffy's like, that's a pretty good dream. And he unties Zoro, and Zoro's telling him, like, even though you're untying me, like, I'm not going to join your crew. And Luffy's like, that's fine. Like, I, I just think it's a waste for you to be here when you could be out there living out your dream. And so this seems to make an impression on Zoro. And Luffy leaves. And we have this comical moment where Nami, dressed as a Marine, is down at this area where like, all these other scrolls and stuff are being locked up. And some of the Marines start catching on to the fact that she's not one of them. So she knocks them out. And she's looking for a scroll of the Grand Line. And as she's doing this, Luffy falls from the ceiling. And we just have this moment that's straight out of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. That one scene where uh, Mac and Charlie are like staring at each other from across the bar. We get something like that where Luffy and Nami are just like looking at each other <laughs> from um, across a bunch of scrolls. And Nami's like, uh, you know, what are you doing here? I could have you arrested. And Luffy's like, I know you're not a Marine. Like, I overheard everything. And they realize, okay, we're both trying to find the same thing. We're both trying to look for a map to the Grand Line. So we're going to temporarily work together. But we're not a part of a crew. Like, I'm not joining your your group. So Nami and Luffy are able to make their way into Axe Hand Morgan's office where they're trying to find a map to the Grand Line. And eventually, Luffy is able to trigger the switch that reveals this hidden safe and Nami is trying to break into the safe because they figured the map is going to be in there. As this is going down, Zoro, who's now free, makes his way to Helmelpo's room but where Helmelpo is uh, naked, standing in front of a mirror and swinging Zoro's precious katana around. And uh, Zoro shows up and um, Helmelpo basically begs Zoro not to kill him. And Zoro's like, oh, I'm not going to kill you. I'm going to do something much worse. And then that's when we cut back to Luffy and Ami, who uh, aren't able to get the safe open by the time Axe Morgan breaks in. And so Luffy uses his gum gum powers to rip the safe out. But using the powers and momentum sends him and Nami flying out of the building. They crash into the courtyard. And that's when we get our big showdown where Luffy and Nami get surrounded by Marines and they have to fight their way through. And I will say the fights, they were okay. The fight scenes in this, it, it, it all, it all kind of depends. Some of the fight scenes are just pretty interesting. Some of them are, they're not the greatest, but they're not terrible either. Like, I think they're, they're pretty fine. A bit comedic, a bit over the top. So we have Nami and Luffy trying to fight all these guards. And eventually the numbers get too much. And as this is happening, Zoro is walking past all this. And he actually walks by the gates. And just on the other side of the gates is freedom. But he stops and he turns and he looks and he sees that L Luffy and Nami need help. And he kind of just thinks for a moment. He's like, all right. He rushes in and he starts fighting and helping out the crew. And um, that's when Captain Axe Morgan shows up and basically calls out the crew. And we get this funny moment where Nami and Zoro at the same time are like, we're not together. We're not part of his crew. They object, but it's pretty obvious that they are. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we have a, a scene where Nami starts fighting off the Marines while Zoro and Luffy team up to battle Axe Hand Morgan, who it turns out that it's not just his axe hand that's a weapon, but his entire body is a weapon. And so it takes the two of them fighting together to take out Axe Hand, but eventually they're able to. I, I like how we get this moment where at first, while they're working together, they're not necessarily working together. What I mean by that is they're attacking Axe Hand Morgan, but they're not doing it at the same time. Like one goes first and the other one goes, and they're kind of interrupting each other. Um, so them working together is kind of doing more harm than good. Uh, like we even have a scene where Luffy tries to throw a punch, but Axe Hand grabs it and chucks him into Zoro. And then slowly over time during the fight, they start being more cohesive in actually being able to do stuff together. Like Zoro will do something to set up for Luffy to come in and do a, a blow. I, I like how we started off the scene with them almost kind of getting in each other's way until eventually by the end, they are actually working together. So it just kind of a nice little dynamic of showing this relationship building in during a fight. And we also get a cool moment where we see why Zoro has the third sword and what he does with it. 
because that's something that Luffy was questioning earlier. Like, he, he carries three swords, but I only ever see him use two. And so we have Zoro putting on his bandana. And anyone who's ever read the manga or watched the anime, you know as soon as Zoro puts on his bandana, that means that real shit's about to go down. And uh, yeah, he takes out the third katana and he puts it in his mouth. And that's how he fights with three uh, swords at the same time. And he goes and he uh, he takes out Axeman with the help of Luffy. So together, the, t- uh, the two of them are able to take him out. They make their escape. They, they get on a boat and they start sailing for the open seas with the safe. And then that's when we get a scene where we see Garp. He receives a phone call on a uh, Den Den Mushi. And uh, I love the fact that they kept a Den Den Mushi in. Here's like another thing that's really over the top. The Denden Mushi are basically like these giant snails, but they work as like cell phones. <laughs> and I like the fact that they don't like explain what exactly they are. We just see this giant snail on this desk, and then it's kind of like making this ringing noise with its mouth. And then we just see a guy pick up a speaker off its shell and start talking to it. And that's it. That's all the description that we need to know we don't need to explain what this creature is what its backstory is why it's able to communicate across the seas and stuff i love the fact that it just leaves it to our imaginations like this world's already weird and whimsical so here's just another weird thing that we can put in there and yes it is from the, the manga but i i love the fact that they kept that in gar perceives a call where he is told that the map to the grand line was stolen and it was stolen by a guy wearing a straw hat and so now luffy who is trying to make a name for himself is starting to make a name for himself and then we get a a final little scene where we see kabaji in this um kind of dark area with just a single spotlight on him and he's reporting uh about the three pirates who stole the map and how he wasn't able to get the map before they were able to take it and it turns out that the captain he's talking to is Captain Buggy. And I will say that I actually really love the design for Captain Buggy. I thought they nailed it perfectly. Just this crazy evil clown. And it works. And uh, yeah, there's kind of just like a brief breakthrough of the first episode. I loved it. It was surprisingly good. I was not expecting it to be that freaking good. Like from 1 to 10, I'd give it a 9. It was awesome. My only complaint would just be that some of the fight scenes were a little bit weak, I guess you can say. They weren't terrible or anything, but they could have been a little bit better. But other than that, like I, I love the fact that this series embraces the crazy, over-the-top, just cartoony look and feel of the original One Piece series. It doesn't shy away from that. It just embraces it, and it runs with it. And that's how... Uh, certain anime ser- like adaptations should be done. Don't be scared of the kind of cartoony stuff that like an original franchise has. Embrace it. I think that's my problem with a lot of adaptations, especially like the comic book stuff, where we see all these comic book movies, TV shows, where they're trying to make everything more serious and dramatic and realistic, and they don't want to just like adapt some of the more cartoony aspects from the comics. And it's like, nah, man, you just you just got to embrace it. Comics, I mean, superheroes are already kind of weird. You got dudes in spandex running around fighting crime. Like, just embrace the wackiness. And uh, that's what One Piece, the Netflix adaptation does. It just embraces the crazy wackiness. And it works. And so, yeah, I, I love this episode. I'm hoping the rest of the series continues to be this great. I guess we'll find out. But this was fantastic. I highly recommend checking it out. For anyone who was like on the fence, for anyone who was like, oh man, I've already been burned out. Like I tried out Cowboy Bebop and it was terrible. I tried out that note and it was terrible. Anime adaptations from Western studios just do not have a good track record at all. I can totally understand that because I was with you on there. And um, I know like people are like, oh, it's a Netflix uh, series. Oh, that's going to be bad, right? I was there too. But no, this is actually really freaking good. So go check it out. It's awesome. And uh, there you go. I hope you enjoyed and I hope to see you next time. Take care. Later.